Hi, my name is Scott Simpson, and today we'll be talking about limiting reagents. So limiting reagents, um, what will happen is, is in a chemical reaction, eventually one of the reactants will run out, and the reaction stops. It goes to completion. So um, we want to be able to predict how this chemical reaction will occur, how much of the product we'll get. Um, reagent. and the resulting values that come about. Uh, this can be useful because if we know how much of each reactant we have, we're going to mix together, we want to be able to predict how much product we need, or let's say uh, we know how much product we have, we need to know how much of each reactant we have, but in some cases a reactant might be very costly, so we have to figure out how much of the reactant we will need. So, uh, in a chemical reaction, Eventually, uh, one of the reactants runs out. One of the reactants runs out, and the reaction will stop. The reactant that runs out, that's what we label as the limiting reagent. So the reactant that runs out, that's our limiting reagent. The other reactants, the ones that don't run out, those are called excess reagents. So reactants don't run out. Those are excess. Reagents. So as an example to this, let's take a more practical look. Um, we're going to look at producing cars. So uh, if we know that each car needs four tires, and we have a given amount of tires and a given amount of like car frames, how many car frames are we going to need, and how many cars are we actually going to be able to produce? That's going to be our question. So example, given each car requires four tires and one frame, how many complete cars will you have? If we have, if we have 20 frames and 72 tires. So there are a couple different approaches you can take. Uh, this is the thought pattern that we're going to go through. The very first thing is, is we're going to calculate the number of tires needed uh, for those 20 frames. So we're going to start with the value of 20 frames. We know we need to get to a different unit. So we know this unit has to match that unit in order to cancel each other out. So we're going to have frames in the bottom. And let's convert to types. And we know from the given stuff in the problem, that for every four tires, we require one frame, and that's going to lead to one car. So in that case, 20 times 4, 80. So we need 80 tires. Okay, well, now let's calculate number of frames. needed for 72 tires. We can do that pretty easily. We know we have 72 tires. 
We have to multiply it by some sort of conversion factor. We know what unit has to go in that denominator. Again, I always stress to look at units first, then plunk in numbers. A lot of times students get confused uh, when they try to do numbers first. So I always suggest units. So we've got tires, and we're going to go to frames. In that case, for every four tires, we have one frame. In that case, we're just dividing by four. So we end up with 18 frames. OK. So now, what are we going to do? Now we need to compare these two values. So looking at these two values, we said that we have uh, 20 frames, 72 tires. If we have 20 frames, we need 80 tires. This is our actual amount, what we have, and this is our theoretical amount, we're going to call it right now. The theoretical amount is uh, how much you have if we consume all of that actual amount. So as an example, we actually have 20 frames. Theoretically, we would need 80 tires to consume all those 20 frames. And then uh, we have 72 tires. We know we need, how many frames was it again? It was 18 frames. So from this, we're going to ask which one runs out first. And that we can easily do. We have to look at units of the same type, so we've got to consider the frame numbers, and we have to compare the tire numbers. We actually have 72 tires, but we need 80 of these guys. So that means the number of tires is going to run out first. So tires run out. So that's when we label our tires as a limiting unit. Then we're going to ask how many cars are we going to have? How many complete cars? This is where we want to consider using the limiting reagent because we know we're stuck based upon the number of tires. We can't produce any more than those number of tires because they're in fact going to run out first. So if we start with 72 tires, we know that we have four tires for every one car. So we're going to divide this through again. It's going to be equal to our number of frames. So in that case, we have 18 cars. OK. Well, what if we consider a more chemical example? Because chances are, here in the chemistry class, uh, that's why we're considering this. So let's look at a more chemical example. In this case, we're going to consider the formation of iron 3 oxide. So, uh, how many grams of iron 3 oxide are produced from the reaction of 17.2 grams of solid iron and 19.6 grams of oxygen gas. Okay, so this is going to be a, a a kind of completion of, if you're going with a Brown and LeMay book of chapter 3, you shouldn't be able to do all of these things. Uh, we're going to have to translate from the names of compounds into the formulas. So we have to first figure out what's our balanced equation. So you have to think of what the reactants are, what the products are. A lot of times the question will give you an idea of what they are. So we know our one of our products, or our only product in this case, it's going to be iron 3 oxide. So Fe2O3. Okay, what are our reactants? We know we have solid iron, so that's just Fe in its solid state. 
and we have oxygen gas. And oxygen is one of the diatomic elements along with uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, and the halogens. They're all di diatomic gases. Yeah. Okay. Again, the approach I take to balancing chemical formulas is, is I look at the most complicated molecule in the equation and I put a 1 in front of it. Then I start balancing the other molecules, or excuse me, other atoms, focusing on atoms that only appear once on each side. In this case, we only have systems that appear once on each side, but in more complicated examples, uh, that's the approach I would take. So let's balance our irons. We've got a 1 coefficient out front, we need a 2 here, and then we have 2 irons on both sides. In this case, we have 3 oxygens. We're going to need a 3 halves here to balance our number of oxygens. However, when you look at this, uh, you know that you do not want fractions in your uh, balanced chemical equation, so we need to multiply everything by a coefficient to get rid of that. In this case, the coefficient, it's just going to match that denominator, so 2. We multiply everything by 2, so this becomes 4, that becomes 3, that becomes 2. Okay, now we have almost all the information we need to go forward, start the question. Okay, so let's start with something we know. We know we have 17 grams of solid iron and 19.6 grams of oxygen. Let's start with that iron. We have 17.2 grams iron. We want to get that into something we can compare. We can't really compare masses, but we can compare moles. So let's try to get to moles. So the unit that has to go down here has to match this guy. So we got grams of iron. We're going to convert to moles of iron. If you look on the periodic table, you'll find it's 55.845 grams for every one mole. When you multiply that through, you get 0. Point, or excuse me, 0. 0.308 moles of Fe. And again, I would suggest to keep your, your units and keep track of the different um, substances that you're considering. Pretty soon there's going to be a bunch of numbers, there's going to be a bunch of moles, so by labeling this it saves you a headache later on. So I, I know it's a really big and tough thing to write out two extra letters, or in some cases a handful of extra letters, but in reality it's not much work and it will save you trouble later on. So just go for it. All right, now we need to do this, the same thing with oxygen, 19.6 grams of O2. We know the unit down here has to match that, so we got grams of O2 for every mole of O2. So you can look this up on the periodic table, add those things together. It's 31.998 grams for every one mole of this guy. You multiply that through, you get 0 0.613 moles. O2. Now the problem becomes a lot of times students look at these numbers and they say, hey, this one's the smaller one, therefore we have a limiting reagent. No, you don't want to do that. Why don't you want to do that? If you notice the units, the units are actually different. We're not comparing moles of the same sample. In order to say which one's the limiting reagent, we have to compare moles of the same sample. So these are our actual amounts. Let's try to calculate the theoretical amount, or the amount that we would need of the other reagent to consume the reagent we're considering. So if we're considering iron, let's see how much oxygen we would need to eat up all of this iron. So we can do that with another conversion factor. We know what unit has to go in this denominator. We got moles of iron. And we're trying to consider how much O2 we need, so let's put moles of O2, to O2 up top. We have a 4 in the denominator, a 3 up top. Those numbers, they came from this balanced equation, hence that mole-to-mole -mole ratio. So now we know that. Multiplying this through, we get 0 0.231 moles of O2. Now let's do the same thing. Let's calculate the theoretical amount of iron we would need to consume this much oxygen. So let's do that. So we got mole, O2, mole, Fe, or 4, 3. Again, that's from the balanced equation. We can multiply this through. The result I get is 0 0.817 moles of iron. And these are our theoretical amounts. Okay. What I suggest at this point is to build a table. And in this table, we're going to have the substance, the actual amount we need, and the theoretical amount. And we're going to compare these two values, and we're going to be able to determine which compound is our limiting reagent. 
So we have a substance. We have our actual amount. We have our theoretical amount. The only two reactants or reagents that we have in this case are iron and O2. The actual amounts, they're listed here. So we actually have 0 0.308 moles of iron. We have 0 0.613 moles of oxygen. Now the theoretical amount we need. Notice the units have switched. So theoretically, we need 0 0.231 moles of O2, and we need 0 0.817 moles of iron. Now let's consider which one's larger. If we look at the iron numbers, the actual amount is smaller than the theoretical amount, and then if we compare oxygen, the actual amount is larger than the theoretical amount that we have. So knowing that, that means iron is our limiting reagent. Which means that oxygen is our excess reagent. Okay, now we need to consider which of these values to use. And we want to go with the limiting reagent value. We know where our chemical reaction is limited by the amount of iron in our system. So now we're going to use those numbers to calculate how much of our product we're going to get. So I'm just going to erase this portion. So, let's start with those moles of iron. We know what unit has to go in the denominator, moles, Fe, has to go in the denominator. And if we consider the question, we're trying to get to grams of iron 3 oxide, so we need moles of iron 3 oxide. Using the balanced equation, we have a 2 up top, 4 in the bottom. However, we're not at our grams yet, so we still have another conversion that we have to do. The unit that goes in the denominator, we got moles, Fe2O3, and we're going to be converting to grams of this substance. If you look this up uh, on the periodic table, add everything together to get your molecular weight, or your molecular mass, you'll find it's 159.687 grams for every one mole. You multiply that through, the result you get is 24.6 grams Fe2O3. Okay, so uh, what we've looked at is, is we've looked at how to diagnose if one of your reagents is a limiting reagent and how to predict amounts of this. Now this was a longer roundabout way compared to some other methods. What you could have done is taken these grams of iron converted to grams of iron oxide taking these grams of oxygen, also converted that to grams of iron oxide, and then see which reagent gives you the least amount of product. I prefer to do it this way because it gives you more practice. Um, also, if you're asked about excess reagents, you have the numbers right here already calculated, so it makes that easy. So um, use whatever method works best. In some cases, it might be more beneficial to use this method over the other method. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank you for watching, and please leave any comments if you have them below. Thanks.